Before we look at our text today, I wanted to make one little announcement. I had hoped that this equipment would arrive before today. Only one part has arrived. But we have ordered an assisted listening device system so that those who have difficulty hearing me, although we have turned up the speakers this week, I hope you can tell that, but if it sounds mumbled or jumbled to you, we will have available, the Lord willing, next week, wireless headphones so that you won't have to plug in. I simply haven't had time to put in more of the headphones like we have on a couple of sides, but there will be wireless system uh, for those who have difficulty in distinguishing what I am saying. So I hope that encourages you, uh, and uh, hopefully it will be here next week. The first part arrived yesterday. I expect the second box, which has the transmitter, to arrive either tomorrow or Tuesday. And so now please take your Bibles and turn with me over to Psalm 23, which is where we have been looking at one of the magnificent names of God, Jehovah the Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We've gotten down to the last two verses in that psalm, which describes for us the character of Jehovah as the shepherd of Israel and describes for us the character of of our Lord Jesus Christ, who claims to be the good shepherd. In verses 5 and 6 we read, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of of the Lord forever. Last week we were looking at the cup in that second to last phrase, my cup runs over. It's a cup that never runs dry. It's like an artesian spring that constantly replenishes with fresh and cool and living waters. It is described in scripture as the cup of salvation. It is the cup that has the brim flooding water of the Holy Spirit for those who have placed their faith in Jesus. And Jesus himself promised that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Spirit which was not yet given. It's a cup that holds the indwelling Spirit of God permanently the great promise that we see in Acts chapter 2. It is a cup that must be kept pure and clean for the master's use. For those who have placed their faith in Christ have been given the Spirit of God inside that vessel. And we must be vessels that are meet or fitted well for the master's use. It's a cup where the waters are offered freely and eternally. And so we see thus far, Psalm 23 has portrayed our Lord Jesus Christ as the shepherd, but we noted also last week that he is not only the shepherd, he is the Lamb of God that leads other little lambs to drink the living waters, the cup that gives eternal refreshment. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat, for the Lamb, not merely the shepherd, the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. When you come to Jesus, Jesus gives you rest. 
And so Jesus applies this particular name of God to himself. And Jesus fulfills all 14 character qualities of the shepherd in Psalm 23. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And again, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. Jesus as the shepherd also prepares a place where we will dwell with him in the house of the Lord forever. As we see in this last phrase of the psalm. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The promise of the shepherd who has a fold for his sheep, that we will be with him not just now, but that we will be with him forever. And so last week we began looking at how pastors and elders are supposed to reflect the good shepherd as under shepherds. We have a very weighty and awesome responsibility to reflect before the congregation the character of Christ, the one who is the chief shepherd, and the responsibility of caring for the flock. Now the God of peace, Hebrews 13, 20, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. He is the chief shepherd. We are called under shepherds. Peter tells us that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And he warns those who are pastors and elders, feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There are many men in ministry, many men in spiritual offices who are not qualified for those offices, either as pastors or as elders or as deacons. They fill an office without the qualifications of the office, for they have gotten into office by some other way. Our Lord spoke of that when he spoke of himself as the good shepherd. He said, the thief climbs up some other way. It's imperative that a man who is in ministry or in spiritual office in the church be placed there and ordained by God, not merely by men. Jeremiah 23 verse 4 says, and I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. It is God who ordains and appoints spiritual leaders, not man. Some who are not qualified push into office. Others who are qualified shrink back from office and don't want to take the responsibility, though they will be held account accountable if they don't. That brings us today to what the Bible says about bad shepherds. And how can you as a congregation, as the flock, tell the difference between a bad shepherd and a good shepherd? They're rather important because the church does have a say in the call of pastors the church does have a say in the election of elders. 
The church does have a say in the election of deacons and trustees and others who take positions of leadership in the church. So how can you tell? Are there any indicators as to who makes a bad under-shepherd and who makes a good under-shepherd over the flock? Remember what Jesus said. We read the passage. He gave at least ten definitive markers in John chapter 10 as to how you can tell a bad shepherd from a good shepherd. I'm going to read that and I will number them as we go through and make comment about them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, number one, entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. Someone who does not enter in by the door, who has trusted a false way of salvation, because Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. Someone who may pretend to be a believer, but in fact who has not entered in by the door. Then we get to number two, but climbeth up some other way. He wants to get into the sheepfold some other way. He's not been called by God. He's not been appointed by God. He's not been ordained by God, but he's gone through all the human route. He's come in a different way. Perhaps his parents wanted him to be a minister. Perhaps his parents pushed for it and paid for it. Perhaps he looked at it and thought, well, you know, it may not pay much, but you sure can't beat the hours, 11 to 12 on Sunday. <laughs> Wrong approach for those going into ministry. Climbeth up some other way. Perhaps he's teaching a different way of salvation. Perhaps he's teaching a different way of sanctification. Jesus goes on, the same is a, and here's our third test, a thief and a robber. Christ minces no words. False shepherds are thieves and robbers. They will steal from you. You've perhaps seen some of these on television who tell you that you just don't have enough faith. If you would just send more money to them, that would answer your prayer request, that would get you healed, that would give you an answer to some kind of prayer that only you know and suddenly it will appear to you. The same as a thief and a robber. Verse 5. And a stranger they will not follow. You know, we as parents have often told our children, and if you were a parent or if you had parents, and I'm sure you did, they probably told you, watch out for strangers. That's what we tell our kids. Check with your parents first to see whether this adult is somebody that you can trust. Don't take candy from strangers. Don't get into cars with strangers. Jesus calls these strangers. And he says, the sheep know not the voice of strangers. Why is that? Because the sheep are attuned to the voice of the shepherd. But if you never listen to the voice of the shepherd, you will not be able to tell the difference. How often do you listen to the shepherd? This is the shepherd's voice. This is where the shepherd tells you what you may do and what you may not do. This is where the shepherd tells you all that you need to know for your comfort in times of distress. This is where the shepherd feeds you. This is where the shepherd leads you. This, the Bible, is the shepherd's voice. 
If you do not know the shepherd's voice, you will be deceived by strangers. Listen to what the shepherd says. Test what the stranger says by scripture. Is it sound doctrine? Verse 8. All that ever came before me. There's our fifth test. There were many false messiahs at the time of Christ. Starting several centuries before the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, there was a rising expectancy that the Messiah would soon come. And there were many who came seeking to lead the people and proclaiming themselves to be the Messiah. Some of them are mentioned in the scriptures in the book of Acts where Peter and John are on trial and they're sent out of the room and Gamaliel stands up and he mentions two different men who had been defeated and their plans had come to nothing. And so Gamaliel counsels, let these men alone because if this is from God, we can't resist it and we'll be found fighting against God and if it's not of God, it will come to nothing. We can see that it was from God. Here we are 2,000 years later. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, false messiahs. And you know, every modern heresy that we can find in the modern world can be tracked back before Christ. If you know Jesus, you can discern it not merely in the past, but in the present. But the sheep did not hear them. Christ has those who are his own sheep, those who are his elect, those whom he has called by name. There is a general call of the gospel, but there is a specific call by name for those who are his sheep. And then he tells us the sixth way to tell those who are the thieves. The thief cometh not but for and three things, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That tells you their program, that tells you the results. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And then we get to the seventh key factor demonstrating who is a bad shepherd. But he that is, number seven, an hireling. Do you know what a hireling is? A hireling is somebody who is only doing the job for the money. A hireling is somebody who would not do the job unless he got paid. A hireling is somebody who only is motivated by his own income. A hireling and not the shepherd. Eight. Next test, whose own the sheep are not. In other words, he has no personal investment in the flock. He has no personal investment in the flock. A hireling whose own the sheep are not. Number nine, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. He's somebody who is only looking out for himself. He is somebody who doesn't care what happens to the sheep. Which, by the way, as we'll see shortly, God calls his flock. He says, it's my flock, it's my flock, it's my flock. Someone who is only looking out for himself, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. 
Verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling. And number 10, careth not for the sheep. He doesn't care what happens to them. He has no interest in what happens to them. He only cares about Friday afternoon when the bell rings. And when he can walk by the office and pick up his paycheck. Whose own the sheep are not, careth not for the sheep. God places a curse on bad shepherds and gives further markers. Here it's in the context of the priests and leaders of Israel. Isaiah 56, verse 11. They are greedy. That's covetous. Greedy means covetous. Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5 tells us that covetousness is idolatry. It tells us that the covetous man is an idolater. You may not have statues before which you bow, but if you've got covetousness in your heart, God calls you an idolater. You don't have to have a Buddha that you light incense in front of. If you've got covetousness in your heart, God says you are an idolater. And here are the priests and the leaders of Israel. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. They keep pushing for more for themselves and more for themselves and more for themselves. And they've got to have a raise and they've got to have a raise and they've got to have a raise and they've got to have a raise. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. Now remember, we're talking about the religious leaders of Israel here. They are shepherds. They're called shepherds. But they're described as greedy shepherds, self-centered shepherds. They're described as dogs, which to Israel, <laughs> that was a really nasty thing to call someone because that's what they called Gentiles. And yet God calls the religious leaders dogs. They are shepherds that cannot understand. Why? They have a lack of knowledge of God. They have a lack of knowledge of the Bible. He goes on. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. You know, this is not just an isolated instance that we've seen Jesus mentioning. It's given as an illustration by Paul of the apostates. It's given here of, by Jeremiah, or excuse me, Isaiah, as an illustration of those who are false teachers. Jeremiah also speaks of it. Jeremiah 25, also Jeremiah chapter 50. Howl ye shepherds and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. Ever have a beautiful vase on the shelf and you accidentally knocked it off and it shattered in a million pieces? God said that's what's going to happen to these who are the false shepherds of Israel. Verse 36, A voice of the cry of the shepherds and an howling of the principle of the flock shall be heard, for the Lord hath spoiled their pasture. God himself is the one who will judge those who are bad shepherds. Chapter 50, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Their shepherds had taught them false doctrine. They have turned away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. <laughs> well, they're still up there a little bit. But they've moved from spiritual high places to mediocrity in their spiritual life. They've gone from mountains to hills. They have forgotten their resting place. The Good Shepherd leads us to places of rest, to still waters, to green pastures. Our resting place is in the Lord. David reminds us of that in Psalm 37 and verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We can rest in the Lord. 
The principal way to tell a bad shepherd is when you can see that he is only in it for himself. Ezekiel tells us this, chapter 34, verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You see, when we get to the New Testament, and when Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd, and when he speaks of pastors and elders and other church leaders as shepherds, there is a context to it. There is a history to it. God has spoken over and over and over and over in the Old Testament, talking about the leaders, the religious leaders, as shepherds who are not doing what God has called them to do. Those same warnings about bad shepherds are how Jude and Peter describe the apostate teachers. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, he's telling you about these people, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you. Now remember what's a shepherd supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be feeding the flock. What do they do when they feast with you? Feeding themselves without fear. That was the curse that God placed on the shepherds of Israel in the Old Testament. That they were only feeding themselves. Should not the shepherd, God said, feed the flock? feeding themselves without fear. Clouds, they are without water. What does your shepherd do? He leads the sheep to water. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. There's nothing to eat. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Peter talks about them in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. They won't follow a stranger because they don't know his voice. People who do not know the voice of the shepherd follow strangers. Peter is warning believers who are not paying attention to the word of the shepherd that there are going to be those who follow false teachers. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What did Jesus say? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. By whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, here we have it again. Just like we saw in the Old Testament, and as Jesus warned about, and as Paul warned about, now Peter is warning about it. Through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words, that's make-believe, you know what it is to faint, not faint over when you pass out, but when you are fighting with swords and you make a move as though you would go one way and your opponent goes that way and then you get him. With feigned words, make merchandise of you. What does it mean to make merchandise? It means they're going to sell you. Jesus bought us. He paid for us with his blood. These false teachers will, rather than sacrificing for you, they will sell you 
because they're full of covetousness. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day, daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're in it for what they get out of it. Having eyes full of adultery, they're immoral. And that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. Dear people, where do you get your stability? Where do you get your stability? What is the rock upon which we stand? It's the word of God. If you're standing on anything else, you are not stable. And you are about to be beguiled as an unstable soul. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices. He brings it up again. If you haven't gotten it by now, that's the way in which you tell who bad shepherds are. Cursed children. Those warnings about bad shepherds continue in Ezekiel 34. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd. Neither did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. Do you understand the serious nature of being in church leadership? There are many young men going through seminary who do not get it. I know, I went through seminary with lots of them. There are many young men going through seminary for all kinds of odd reasons. And they're going to graduate and go into, quote, ministry. If you are not called by God, and that includes not only the call for a pastor, these passages are talking about spiritual leaders, the whole group of spiritual leaders. They're not merely talking about the high priest. They're talking about all those in positions of leadership in the church. If you have not been called by God and ordained by God and commissioned by God, you should not be in leadership because God himself says he will judge. Jehovah, the shepherd of Israel, does battle to protect his flock. And that brings us back to that name, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, which we saw before. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 3, Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. The false shepherds are called the goats here. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them his goodly horse in the battle. Bad shepherds being called goats. Do you know what Jesus said would happen to the goats when Christ judges at the end of the tribulation? When the Son of Man shall come, Matthew 25, 31, in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And jumping down to the end of that passage, here's Jesus addressing the goats. 
Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is serious business. There is a shepherd that loves you. You are one of his sheep. There is a shepherd who watches out for you. You are part of his flock. There is a shepherd who calls and ordains men to be under shepherds for your good and benefit. And any woe to him who takes such a position and comes under the curse of God, for he is a goat. Jesus viewed the people as his sheep. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Chapter 26, then Jesus saith unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. What does the shepherd do? He teaches the flock. He feeds the flock. That's what teaching is all about. He teaches. He saw they were like sheep without a shepherd. So what did he do? He taught them. Dear people, that's what I'm trying to do. Because I do love you. And I know sometimes it's hard for you to hear what I say, not merely because of the physical problem, but it's difficult to eat the food of the Word of God. Some of it is milk. The scripture calls it milk. The easy doctrines. Some of it is meat. That's the difficult doctrines. Some of us are used to a few of the difficult doctrines, all those great doctrines that relate to the sovereignty of God. But we gag on the doctrines that deal with the practical application of the word of God and not merely head theology. God wants us to apply the scripture to the way in which we live. And it's amazing what joy comes when we do that. Not the pride of knowing it all, but the joy of walking with the shepherd. Are you ready? Let's move to verse 6 and take the very next phrase. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Remember Jesus said, my sheep follow me. Now it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We follow the shepherd and goodness and mercy follow us. In other words, when we follow the shepherd, we leave a trail that follows behind us, goodness and mercy. Usually when we think about that phrase in the verse, goodness and mercy, following us, we think that the goodness and mercy is what we get, and we're not accountable for what we do with it. But that's not a matter of the shepherd merely giving goodness and mercy to us. That, of course, is true that we are recipients of his goodness and mercy. But there is more to that phrase than just our own personal benefit. When we follow the shepherd, it changes our lives so that we have goodness and mercy following us. 
There are several Hebrew words that are translated follow. The word used here is radaf. It means to run after, to pursue, to follow hard on the heels of, to chase. Does goodness follow? That is, run quickly behind you in your path? Do you leave a trail of sweet-smelling goodness? Beneficial goodness everywhere you go? When people come in contact with you, do they experience the goodness that follows? Does mercy follow hard on your heels? Do you leave a trail of immediate compassion, healing mercy, relief to those who are suffering everywhere you go? You know, bloodhounds can follow a person over uncharted wilderness areas because that person has left a scent that is uniquely attached to that person. It uniquely identifies that person. In the physical world, some people use mild cologne. Some use, and I know you've smelled some of this, overpowering battle-ready perfume that nearly knocks you over. Some use deodorant that tries to mask their body odor. But everywhere you go, you do leave a scent that identifies you. You leave an aroma that says, that man or that woman has been in this place. That's not merely in the physical realm. That's true in the spiritual realm. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Now, only one English word is used in these two verses, the word savor. And perhaps most of us think of that in terms of what we taste. But both of these Greek words that are used here relate to the sense of smell. The spiritual scent that we leave behind. In that first phrase, a sweet savor of Christ, Paul uses the word euodia, a good odor. You is the word for good. That's the compound front part of the word. And we find it in many different English words. It means good. Odia, the word from which we get our word odor. A good odor. A sweet smelling fragrance. He says that we are to be a sweet fragrance of Christ. Both to the lost and to the saved. But when he moves to discuss how it affects the lost and the saved, in the very next part of the verse, the phrases savor of death unto death and savor of life unto life, he uses a different word, the word osme. That's a fragrance that can either smell good to the receptor or it can smell bad to the receptor. How it is perceived is determined by the one receiving the smell. That way a smell can be thrilling to one and horrifying to another. Like, for example, the smell of a skunk attracts other skunks, but it repels other animals. The sweet fragrance of Christ in us attracts the elect. It repels the non-elect. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God. Now remember, we're talking about following the good shepherd. And we're talking about what follows us as we follow the good shepherd. 
Be ye therefore followers of God. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. The good shepherd is the one we follow. Be followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. Now listen. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. What are we supposed to be exuding in the spiritual realm? What is it that should flow from us that as we go by, others perk up and scent the scent of Christ? Everywhere you go, you should be leaving the aroma of goodness and mercy following hard in your tracks. In other words, if you are closely following the shepherd, it will have a practical impact on your life. Well, our time is up. In fact, it's past time. This clock is a little slower than that clock back there, which I just saw. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the truth of your word. How we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Good Shepherd. The one who does all those 14 things that we see in Psalm 23. The one who is even now preparing a place for us because we are his sheep and we are part of his fold. How we thank you, Father, that as we follow him, it changes our life. And it leaves an aroma, a scent in the spiritual realm that can be discerned. It's a savor of life unto life in those that believe. It's a savor of death unto death in those that perish. But in all cases, it is a sweet-smelling savor unto God because it exudes from Christ to us and through us to others as goodness and mercy follow in our wake. Make us your people, Father, so that we will be clearly known by the way in which we live and by the aroma of Christ that goes forth from us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 316.